you need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion, perhaps, at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to to step out of the crowd. Even if no one follows after Jesus Christ, you'd be willing to stand if you are the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. You would have to be willing to suffer for persecution for Christ. And let me tell you, it will come. It might even cost you your life. That's the cost factor. It's easy to be a part of a crowd. It's easy to get in line. In fact, the larger the crowd, the easier it is to be inconspicuous and to just blend in. And the easier it is to simply just ride the wave and ride the momentum without ever having to make an individual personal commitment to Jesus Christ. But our Lord is not deceived because he does not measure success in the ministry by the size of the crowd. And our Lord now stops and does something. Our Lord could care less about attenders. Our Lord is after disciples. Jesus never tried to induce the crowd to follow him. Jesus never tried to manipulate decisions. Jesus never sugar-coated the message. Jesus never kept the hard part in fine print where we couldn't locate it. Jesus never softened the requirement. Jesus never marked down the price for following him. And every one of us here today need to do some serious soul searching. And so our Lord now is issuing what are the terms of being a disciple of Christ and what are the terms that would allow one to get in line and to follow after him. These terms are non-negotiable. These terms are absolute. These terms are fixed and set. These terms are unalterable, and they are the same for every one of us. And there is not one thin dime you can bring to the cross and contribute anything to your eternal salvation. But you need to understand the terms for receiving the free gift. And so what our Lord says now is, is, is shocking. What our Lord says is jolting to the crowd. I want all of us, in a sense, to be shocked as we are reminded again of what are the terms that our Lord has issued for anyone to take one step in following after Him. Because if you are to receive the free gift, here's what it's going to cost you. Jesus Christ must be number one in your life or you cannot get in line and follow after Christ. No one just comes into this on a whim. The stakes are too high. It requires too much of you. Jesus calls for a sober calculation that every one of us would undertake in our own hearts and lives. It's going to require the total commitment of all that you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are some of you here today who think you are saved. And the fact is, you are really not. And all you've done is walk an aisle, raise a hand, sign a card, show up at a Bible study, show up at a conference. But the fact of the matter is, you've never done business with God. And you have never come to the place where you're ready to give the entirety of who you are to Jesus Christ. And it is only then that you are able to receive the free gift. I want you to see what Jesus says regarding how to enter into the kingdom of heaven. If anyone, he is saying there are no exceptions to this. If anyone comes to me. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, unquote. See, the issue is who you love the most. And to love the Lord Jesus Christ is not merely feelings. It requires the totality of who you are, mind, emotion, and will. And he is calling for you to love Him 
more than your father, more than your mother, more than your brother, more than your sister. And then he goes for the very juggler vein, yes, and even his own life. And he puts up his hands and he says, or you cannot be my disciple. If you truly love Jesus Christ, your mind is inflamed, your heart is enlarged, and your will is engaged to commit your life, surrender your life, and trust your life to Jesus Christ. And it is a decisive choice of the will when you get down to the bottom. And Jesus understands how easy it is to be self-deceived when you are in the midst of a crowd, how easy it is to be a counterfeit disciple, how easy it is to be swept up in the moment of the larger crowds and to feel like, yeah, I guess I really am rightly connected with Christ, when in reality it is not so, and we cannot follow Christ in anything else. It is an all-or-nothing proposition. We cannot follow Christ and anything else. And I cannot follow Christ and love my job more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love school more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love uh, pleasures more than Christ. I cannot follow Christ and love this world more than Christ. What he is calling for here is absolute radical allegiance to Christ and it involves my own self-denial. And that's why the whole crowd never buys in. Listen, you can't live until you die. And you cannot live for Christ until you have died to self. There cannot be a resurrection until there is first a crucifixion. And there cannot be a resurrection unto life until there has been a crucifixion of your old life. Whoever does not carry his own cross can come after me. It is an active faith. It is a dynamic faith. It is moving out, going with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't carry anyone else's cross, and no one else can carry your cross for you. This is something that only you can do. This is a decision that only you can make. What does it mean to carry one's own cross? The cross symbolized the extremes of excruciating pain and a heartless cruelty that was always ending in death. To carry one's own cross was the dreaded death march, where one would stand before the judge's tribunal and be declared guilty as a criminal before the judge. And as a public display of one's own guilt, one would be forced to carry their own crossbar from the judgment seat all of the way to the site of execution. And it was publicly humiliating. And as one would carry their crossbar on their own shoulders, it was a public testimony of being under the submission of the higher authority of the judge. You are saying, I agree with the judge's condemnation of me and I now yield my life and confess my, my guilt to having breached the law of the higher authority and publicly and openly with all of the shame that is involved in the admission of my own guilt and sin, I now carry the crossbeam all the way to the point of the execution. And the streets of Jerusalem would be filled and, and people would line up along the Via Della Rosa as the executed criminal, the condemned criminal, would carry his crossbeam. And everyone would see that Rome is in charge, and Rome has brought Judea into subjection and submission. And this is yet one more example of one who is under submission. And I am carrying my cross every step of the journey as I follow Christ. And I am in submission to His Lordship, and I surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I now am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I am carrying my cross every step of the journey as I follow Christ. And I am in submission to His Lordship, and I confess my sin, and I am willing to go wherever and whatever He calls me to do. It means to walk as He walked 
to live as he lived, to speak as he spoke, to rejoice in what he rejoices in, and to weep over what he weeps over, because I am now one with Jesus Christ. He will not tell us where he is leading us. He is not going to give us a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. All you need to know is Jesus Christ and to follow him. He calls us to follow him unconditionally. He calls us to follow him in good times and in bad times. There is no one else to follow. There is no other agenda for our life. There is no other purpose for our life, no other passion. Our entire life is centered on Jesus Christ. Rather than our Lord backing off on this and softening the terms, our Lord is actually upping the ante and saying, listen, don't buy into this yet until you have really thought this through because this will be the biggest decision of your life and this will affect the entirety of your life for the rest of your life and this will affect where you will spend all eternity. All the chips are on the table on this hand. You need to really count the cost. No one would go into a building project without first having some idea of what this is going to cost me. How easy it is to start something and how hard it is to finish something. How easy it is to launch into a project. How costly it is to complete it. Here are two competing kingdoms. And here are two competing kings. And here are two competing armies and only one will win, and the other will lose, and the one who loses will be slayed. The one who loses will be subjected for the rest of their days to slavery to the greater king. You don't want to meet this other king who is coming with 20,000 soldiers. He is not coming to play games. He is not coming to be docile. He is coming to dominate, and he is coming to slaughter. This other greater king is none other than the one who is telling the parable, for he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, and at the end of this age, he will bolt out of heaven on a white steed, and his garments are dripped in blood, the blood of his own enemies, and he is coming back to conquer and to damn. You need to make terms of peace with this coming king, or you will be subjected in damnation forever. And Jesus Christ has made terms of peace. You need to settle out of court with him. You do not want to go into that final day of conflict with Christ, for he will be ruthless in the execution of his justice, but he offers you mercy today. He will agree to terms of surrender. He will agree to terms of peace, but they are His terms of peace, not ours. And His terms of peace are very simply this. You must hate your own father and mother and brother and sister and even your own life more than me, or you cannot be my disciple, and you must take up a cross and follow me, or you cannot be my disciple, and if you do not, you will meet me in the final judgment. He's calling for the decision in your heart. He is pressing you for a decision. He will not be put off. You cannot hit the mute button any longer in your heart. You must answer to Him. He is saying, none of you can be a true Christian. None of you can be in my kingdom. None of you can be in right relationship with me or the Father. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. This is our Lord saying. He's not backing off. He is increasing the commitment that he is calling for with every line of this section. What is he saying? Your life is no longer your life, it is now his life. Your time is no longer your time, it is now his time. Your possessions are no longer your possessions, they are now his possessions. Your future is no longer your future, it is now His future. Your treasure is no longer your treasure, it is now His treasure. And you have transferred all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. That's what it is to meet His terms of peace. 
Oh, how we ought to search our hearts here today. Have I come to this place of total commitment in my life? It's going to determine who you marry. It's going to determine what kind of family you raise. It's going to determine what kind of work ethic you'll have. It's going to determine where you worship. It's going to determine really the following of all of the rest of your life. And nothing is outside of this commitment. You need to think about that. And you need to weigh that in the balances of your mind so that you don't make a quick decision and go back home and fall away. Have I yielded my life to the sovereign lordship of him who died upon the cross for me? I want you to know that the gates of paradise have been swung open to you, and the narrow gate is open. And if you will take a step of faith and come through this narrow gate and commit your life to him, him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He is calling you today to come, to come to him, to take a step of faith and to come to him. But if you come to him, don't play games. You must surrender to Christ. I want to ask you very personally. I want to single you out in the midst of this crowd. I want to single you out within your own heart. Have you taken up a cross in order to follow after Christ? Have you recognized your own sinfulness before a holy God in heaven? Have you acknowledged that God's judgment of you is true? Have you acknowledged the right of Christ to rule over your life?